to welcome all of you to this first of two wonderful evenings, Jennifer Morgan and Jessica Marie Johnson in conversation about their stunning books, Dr. Morgan's Reckoning with Slavery and Dr. Johnson's Wicked Flesh. Although we are not meeting physically in the OI offices on the campus at William and Mary, I want to offer the following land acknowledgement. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Nottaway, Chickenahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansaman, Nottaway, Pamunkey, Potawamak, Upper Mattapanai and Rappahannock tribes and pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. So I'm going to introduce this evening's esteemed duo uh, very, very briefly. Uh, Jessica Marie Johnson is assistant professor of history at Johns Hopkins and Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Studies at Harvard University. She is the author of significant works among them the multiple prize winning Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World, published in 2020 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Jennifer Morgan is professor of history in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University, where she also serves as chair. And she is the author of significant works among them, a foundational text in early American history, laboring women, reproduction and gender in a new world slavery, and now reckoning with slavery, gender, kinship and capitalism, in the early Black Atlantic, just published with Duke University Press. Dr. Morgan also serves as the chair of the Council of the Omohundro Institute. I want to encourage everyone to learn more about these scholars' brilliant work and their professional service along multiple vectors. If you have questions, we'll have a limited time. Um, please use the chat and I will do my best to um, collect some of those. Um, and now I'm going to get out of the way so that we can get to this highly anticipated conversation. Hello, Hello Professor Morgan. Hello, Professor Johnson. How are you? Um, I'm good. I am so full of feeling right now. I am so, 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 so excited to, to be able to chat with you um today here among all of our um among all of our friends so um thank you so much for doing this with me today's so. journey um i know that everyone is here um and that people want to hear about um your amazing book and uh are are just yes eager to hear from you about the book so why don't you um give us maybe mm -hmm. some big picture Mm -hmm. on um, Reckoning with Slavery, at, which I have here. Hello, everyone. Um, and, uh, and situate us in the, in the story, in the text, in the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and now we're back to Jessica and Jennifer. So thank you, Jessica, <laughs> for, for being uh, in conversation with me here because, you know, Jessica and I have been in conversation for some time. Um, and thank you to Karen Wolf and Martha Howard and everybody who's helped to organize today. And I hope that everyone who's here today will also join us tomorrow. Um, same bat time, same bat channel um, to, uh, to, to reverse the chair so that I get to talk to Jessica about her amazing Wicked Flesh. Um, I think that I set out to write a book about race and racism and numeracy in the early modern period. I was, I was um, in very good company uh, in my frustration with the prison hold that quantifiable evidence um, concerning slavery had on the field. I felt like there were presumptions about about social history more broadly, right? But that the presumptions that you start with demography, you start with the data, you ask the question, who was there, right? And that's who you who you tell the story about. And of course, those of us who work on the history of slavery broadly, those of us who work in the early modern history of slavery and race and racial formation are constantly pushing 
up against an archive that doesn't even want to tell us very much about who was there. Um, so, and you know, when I say I was in very good company, I'm thinking about, um, you know, the problem of the mathematics of black life in, in Catherine McKittrick's words. There's so many um, scholars who have been, who've been working through and around this question of, 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 of data and black life and death. Um, I have a list of names that I'm going to try to call out as we go because there are so many important um, people that I've been in conversation with so, for so many years. But in any case, the book project was an effort to think through the relationship between um, new modes of thought that are associated with facticity, um, value, trade, demography that are emerging in the English Atlantic in the late uh, 16th, early 17th century and new modes of thought about race, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the ways in which um, uh, knowledge formation kind of comes into being is that, is that ideas about race are thought to occupy, I think, a different place in the historical literature, right? It's the place of prejudice, it's the place of avarice, it's the place of, 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 of violence. Um, and then demographic thought is, is in a different, falls under a different category and that, is not the case, right? We know that that is not the case. Um, uh, and so I began thinking about what it meant. Um, the question then emerges, which is how then do black women, do African women navigate and experience the kind of rationalist claim to their bodies that are being made in the context of the slave trade? And in this, I'm really indebted to Stephanie Smallwood's work, um, her, her effort to write a social history of commodification. And what I wanted to do was pull back to an earlier moment to ask some very similar questions. So that's really the big picture. I think that the surprise for me is that once again, I end up writing about kinship. Um, once again, the ways in which I, I experience the archival questions always leads me to ask, how is it that the people, the, 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 the people whose bodies are hailed to produce more and more slave labor, how do they navigate, how do those women navigate um, this, uh, this kind of clash um, uh, this rupture um, and this, 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 again, I said at the beginning, the kind of stranglehold or the prison hold of, of the market um, in the most intimate, right, the most intimate place. So, um, so I start with numeracy and I end with kinship. I mean, you know, you, you do, so you do start with, with numeracy and you do end with kinship, but you know, and we can just start with, you know, that the, the, the very beginning where you're talking about refusing demography, you know, this kind of like refusing the structures of thought and feeling, mm -hmm. and A, that rupture between thought and feeling, but the structures of thought and feeling that have been generated by the early modern world, the world that, that, that slavery made, in particular generated out of, you know, for, for where you're framing it, the, the English speaking Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and so you you do start with with numeracy, you end with with feeling, but like from the very beginning, you're talking about um, this tension between not seeing mm -hmm. what is right in front of us as historians, mm -hmm. the kinships that are right in front of us as historians, mm -hmm. and the work of creating a context in which we're not supposed to see it. Exactly. You know, and and I remember I remember reading the introduction, and, and as I go through and went through the book, coming back to this question of are we not seeing it? Were participants not seeing it then? Or are we refusing to see it? And were they refusing to see it? And I was just wondering if you could talk about some of that, that tension between the seeing and not seeing and, and what we're supposed to recognize as legitimate work and feeling. Yeah, yeah I think so. I, I've, I've been um, uh, going back to that passage in, um, in Azorada, right, where the description, there's a description of a of a sale that is perhaps the first um, sale of a large group of African men and women and children that happens um, in Liz uh, not in Lisbon, in, in Lagos in Portugal uh, in 1444. And the, the language that this, this chronicler, this Portuguese chronicler uses to describe the kind of anguish that happens when the market 
interrupts kin ties, right? These are these are people who were who are captured from a from a, a smallish community. So they actually were they weren't fictively related to one another. They were actually related to one another. And it was obvious to Portuguese observers that that's what was happening. And so as people are being separated from brothers and from and sisters, from parents, from children, they are, they are refusing it. They are rushing back to each other. They are holding on to each other as they are ultimately torn apart. So Zorada describes this and he, he says, you know, we could not help but be affected by this. But he then immediately returns to this kind of logical discussion of how the capture of Africans is going to bring a smile to the prince's face because it's going to enrich the crown. And here's where, here's where they captured this many and here's where they captured that many. And so you have in this moment um, uh, that, that refusal, that recognition, there are glimpses, there are archival glimpses of what is happening uh, in the 15th century as enslaved, as, as captive Africans are being transformed into uh, slave labor by the marketplace. And we see simultaneously their refusal, their, their constant saying of no, I am a, I'm a, I'm a member of this community. I have, I have ties, I have, I have connection um, and the market and the slave owner and the slave trader again and again destroying that. So, so I, that doesn't answer, answer your question, Jessica, like, so who's refusing to see it? Because it is there, but I think we are accustomed to the, we're accustomed to the, the ledger book. We're accustomed to the, to the, the records of the court, of the trader, of the ship captain, um, and the inability to locate um, human stories in those ledgers, right? And so that's the, and so it's, you know, in some way it's easier to do the quantifiable work on the slave trade, right? And to, and to imagine that that is transparent. Say, okay, well, I can at least know this many people came and the, this many people died and this many people were captive, right? But even that as, even that is is sort of riven through with um, with not seeing right with not seeing women with not seeing children with not seeing the sexual um, abuse of women that leads to pregnancies on board ships like all of those things of not seeing so <sighs> <laughs> right <laughs> like deep breath because um, the not seeing is is really intense, you know, and even though you, you do step back from thinking about numbers, one of the things that you set out immediately is that in this early period up until 1700, women and children or women and girls are actually a significant population yes. aboard ships and landing in at least the English colonies of the of the Americas. I think a, a lot of uh, this text is also about um, you know, the, the, the spaces that tend to sometimes drop out of our, um, our Atlantic hegemony, like the Spanish speaking areas, Puerto Rico, DR, um, the, the, the spaces that are, that are far from, considered far conceptually from Barbados or Jamaica. Um, but, you know, even in the context of like seeing the actual numbers, there is actually a significant number of women. Like we're yes. talking about a founding of an Atlantic world that is female or gendered feminine. Exactly. And I think that that's, so that one of the, one of the things that historians who are interested in gender sexuality and early, especially the early history of slavery have to contend with is that we know, right, we know that there are more women um, who are uh, captured in on the African coast and transported in those early decades than there would come to be, right, in the 18th century, in the 19th century. Um, but it's still, it's the, the evidence is still a little spotty. Like we have, there are moments in which you can see them and there are moments in which you can't. And this, this leads us to questions about how gender is, 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 is like, um, interlocked with this new ideology of race. So women are not, are, are, there's still this tension, this sort of presumption that all slave, all people who are purchasing other people want men, right? And that men are the, are the, the sort of 
you know, men are the 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 single piece uh, piece de indice, right? The, the 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 whole value, and women are partially valued. But in fact, what we see is that the idea of slavery and the idea of of race and racial and and race marking a person as enslavable, right? Is um, is always interconnected with the labor that women are performing, um, and and that and and we have to we have to as we're thinking about what creates this ideological formation that is hereditary racial slavery. We have to recognize not just the symbolic presence of women, but the actual presence of women in those early in those early uh, settlements. The way that the the presence of women um because you do you know like i like, like you're saying you do look at the actual at least as far as the data that we have mm -hmm. the actual data that we have um that 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 in of itself ought to transform how we're thinking about who you know the quote unquote slave is who the um ideal um laborer that is being captured um mm -hmm. aboard ships and um already that changes what we do with that sort of unit of analysis mm -hmm. um and changes the kind of labor that we are sort of witnessing and how that labor is understood. So there's something really fascinating um, about and important about the way that you begin to ask us to think about what does accounting for um, African conceptions of the market, um, African ideas of numeracy, do for how we think about the slave trade um, and those who are captured, do for how we think about how Europeans understood their interaction with, with Africans. And of course, this brings up Herman Bennett's amazing book on um, the early period of, of Iberian interaction mm -hmm. with West Africa and West Central Africa, where you have ideas of sovereignty that are the kind of terms of analysis, the diplomatic you know, negotiations that are happening in this world. Um, and then you, in, in a lot of ways, it seems like you're picking up and in, in, in the moment just after Mm -hmm. where that's beginning to fall away for something much more pernicious, mm -hmm. but that is also still structured around how um, how and what to do with women and girls. Am I getting that right? Because it seems like women, and the, what to do with women and girls and how to think about them is so critical to how the English are interacting with the trade mm -hmm. and the justifications they use, but also what they won't say. Right. Okay. And I think that that, so when I, when, um, when I said that I needed to do a little roll call of names, I mean, obviously Hortense Phillips, right? Obviously the work that she does in Mama's Baby Papa's Baby uh, to, to raise the question of what like ungendering might mean. And, and I, I push back against that notion because what I see happening is that gender is very much determining the way that black women and then black people are being situated as marketable, right? Um, it is, so I, I would argue that there is a kind of, oh, that there is an active process of producing a raced gendered body um, in and for the marketplace that then African women who are very familiar with marketplaces and who come from communities that also are familiar with unfree labor, right? This is not, these aren't new ideas. Um, and, and so there's a knowingness. There's also a recognition, I, I'm arguing. Um, it's a recognition that is that that comes about both because of the the, the lived experiences that that captives have had prior to being captured, um, but it's also a knowing that comes from um, from the kind of uh, embodied experience of being forced to labor in this new place, um, and an understanding that should one give birth to a child, that that child is locked into the same. Um, category of enslavable uh, as you are, right? And so that those two things, I think, are, are I'm asking us to think about how gender, um, I don't want to, you, okay, so I'm hesitating because I'm trying, I don't want to say, I was about to say how gender subtends race, right? But I don't, I don't want to say that because what I'm trying to, to, to kind of uh, bring into focus is a simultaneity. Right, is that there are three things that are happening here at the same time. One is is commodification, two is racialization, and three is 
regendering. I just made that up, so don't quote me on that, anybody. <laughs> um, but and those things, it, we can, we need to stop trying to disaggregate them. That's what I would say, and, and we need to do the work to try to see them at the same time in these little in these little snippets of time, so that we can understand them better. I mean, one of the things like that understanding, like, and I, I think maybe this goes to the simultaneity of it, is that they, the racing, the gendering, the commodification required each other, which in some ways we know, we always talk about them as co-constituted, but I don't know if we always talk about them as actually fundamentally requiring each other, that it requires that, that, that Zerura moment, it the commodification requires that a mother be torn from her son, but it also requires that a that that the mother is torn from her son in order to compel the mother onto the ship. Exactly. Um, if I'm remembering your yes. that that yes, exactly. So in the same moment, in the same text, um, where where we read the description of uh, the sadness of people being wrenched away, we also get a description of a woman who was too strong to be captured until the Portuguese sailors were like, oh, if we just take her child, she'll just follow us onto the boat. And they were right, right? So that, so that there's this, there's the recognition in both of these cases that they're, that, that enslaved, that African people are fully, and this does, I, I should shout out to Herman Bennett um, because it does build on um, on a history of mutual comprehension, right? So, so I think that there was a moment. This feel, it feels like there was a moment when I was a graduate student where part of what people who are interested in like the the history of racism, what they were interested in 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 identifying is that like racism creates this created this sort of sh this like veil and it meant that Europeans like couldn't see the humanity of Africans. And I have never felt that that was an adequate explanation because first of all, there's this tangible history of diplomatic relationships, right? And negotiations and all of the conversations that happen around, around contact, right? Um, but there's also this, it it lets it it allows us to imagine that there's this this abyss this this oh well they didn't understand what they were doing they saw race and it 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 authorized something it authorized a veil and and I guess I would I would say part of what I'm seeing in this data in the in the records is that Europeans were very cognizant of what they were doing. Right? They were very cognizant that this was a this was a violent appropriation of people's labor, but they decided that it was worth the violence. It was worth the cost. Um, and and if they can know that that's what that was happening, um, I fundamentally believe that um, that captive women um, and men knew what was happening to them as well. Um, and that's the other piece of what I'm trying to. Um, what I'm trying to ask us to think about, even when the archive doesn't want us to think about it, which is what did these first generations of African women and their descendants know? What did they, how did they strategize? How did they assess? How did, how were they involved in rational quantifiable thinking, right? Um, how did they understand the, the impact of the market um, and the, and the and their valuation in the market um, in this space of family formation that was supposed to be a space of intimacy and a space that was outside of the market. I mean, this comes up so importantly in the chapter where you're grappling with what what on land you might call the auction block, but mm -hmm. when you're grappling with sale, mm -hmm. um, when you're grappling, yes, like when you're talking about the ways that, um, and when I was reading it, I was thinking of it as um, the pedagogy of sale. And, and the, um, I've, been, I've been reading um, and rereading M. Jackie Alexander's, um, mm -hmm. I think it's Whose Who's World Order or Whose New World Order, which he talks about, um, you know, um, um, laboring women um, framing their experience as, 
you know, thank God, I, I don't want to eat, just eat, you know, like, I don't want to just survive. Like, I want justice. Thank God, de justicia. And, um, you know, that, that, that the conditions of oppression and violence are also pedagogical. Yes. Um, and that there's a pedagogy that the experience of sale, in the experience of sale that you seem to be charting out that is showing African women in particular something about this world that they're now in. Exactly, exactly. I guess it is, it is, it is part of my intent in this book to ask us to um, find a space in which we can both see the violence and the violation um, and to understand that under conditions of, con of, of incredible violence and violation, people have cognitive capacities and are, and are, and are working to refuse what's happening to them right are working and 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 we know that i'm not i'm not saying that i'm doing something like i'm not i'm, I'm standing on a lot of shoulders here um we know that you know forms of cultural expression are 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 have a political valence um under slavery we know from stephanie camp's amazing work that you know that 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 movement and the body that that adornment and um, and gathering or, you know, Tara Hunter's work to Joy My Freedom, right? Like that we understand that culture has very important political meaning. Um, but at the same time, I think that when we're looking at moments like, like sale, like the Middle Passage, um, we, we sometimes, you know, because it's so hard to look, it's so hard for us to force our gaze in these places of just unbelievable, um, violation, right? And to say, well, something is being produced here, right? And what's being produced, I think, is, you know, this, like, it's this origin of Black radicalism. It's this way in which we can see a political economy, a political consciousness. And, and unfortunately, the political theorists who've done that work have often failed to think about women as being a part of those spaces. Um, when Again, like, you know, I keep on returning to kinship, I keep on returning to reproduction, because I feel that there is some, there's a critical apparatus that can be mobilized when that's about futurity, it's about like, it doesn't require that your body has done it, it's, but it does, it, it, it's like knowing that your body could do that thing, right? I think it's a, it's an analytic of futurity that, um, that is, that is, formed and is racialized um, in this moment, in these early modern moments when also, you know, when things are being worked out, well, some people have already figured it out, <laughs> they, you know, and that's, that's the thing that I'm also pushing, you know, like, yes, there's these moments of indeterminacy, there's, there are spaces in which there's, you know, freedom and blackness and whiteness are kind of coexisting, but I think that ultimately, um, the danger that a racialized market poses for African women and men and their descendants is made crystal clear in 1444 on that dock. Um, and it, it, it remains clear to people. One of the things that, um, and it's, it almost goes right in along these lines of what becomes really clear. So it's interesting to think about, you know, the. The, the book beginning with like not seeing and refusing to see and what historians have not seen and refused to see and you turning that inside out and 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 showing us through the eyes of women that there is not there was no not seeing <laughs> there was literally seeing it all around you all the things that could happen and one of the things that we have to to talk about, um, perhaps you know, gingerly, is the rampant intimate violence, um, and it's important to talk about here. I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, not as a way of sort of, you know, charting, you know, trotting it out for everyone to see, because I hope there's nobody in this room who's not convinced that intimate violence is just an endemic part of the slaving experience on all sides of of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, but because one of the things that seems really clear in your book is that the intimate violence is actually a key player in how and how how um 
how women are recognized and how they're not and why they're not. So the chapter where you're talking about what is on in, in the um, what is in the bookkeeper's logs mm -hmm. and bookkeeping as a technology that is setting out the terms of the debate and how this 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 particular kind of violence is not in there. And as opposed to sitting back and saying as historians have like, oh, well, then maybe this hasn't happened or maybe it was on the occasional or whatever else you're like, maybe it was actually so present. It was unremarkable. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamental rethinking mm -hmm. of how to think about even a document. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also really reshapes it to me how to think about what is getting made as far as affect and facticity in this world. Um, and that rupture between affect and facticity, yeah. you know, I don't know, like it almost seems like it has to happen in order for this early modern world to survive the endemic gendered violence that is happening and being you know, and is occurring over and over and over and is generational and is, is being encouraged by, you know, co colleagues and compatriots. And if you don't do it, you know, who are you? Like there's, this is being made. Um, I don't know, there's something about what you set out that in some ways maps how sexual violence is actually the root of empire in a way that we have talked about it before, but there's something here that is really, seems really important to point out. And I think it's part, part of what, I really appreciate your attention to this. And I think that that for me, when I use this shorthand about like knowledge production or like disciplinary formations and like what constitutes evidence and all of that, I mean, again, you know, this is this is the moment in which, you know, political economy becomes a thing as, a, as this is, and when demography becomes a thing and when, you know, narrative you know, certain kinds of historical narrative becomes a thing. Like these are disciplinary formations that are about, you know, the what's leading us up to the enlightenment, right? And part of what that's doing is offering us a technology of record keeping that is about a disavowal, you know? And again, like this is every, everybody in this room, God, I wish we were in the same room. Everybody in this room knows um, what it means to come up against the archive problem, right? The archive was not built to tell the stories of the people that we are trying to find, right? So we know that it's, we get it, you know, and there's incredibly useful and interesting work about that problem. But I think what we haven't quite also grappled with is that the ways in which we structure our records are designed to make you not see those girls, you know the 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 um, Barbados um, uh, record of sale, and you, I, I I say that like over the course of like three days, twelve individual girls are bought by individual men and like walked off into the countryside, and you're like, okay, please let's just pull this into focus, and let's also pull into focus. So let's pull into focus that violence. Um, let's pull into focus that. Um, I just saw a note that said someone is having trouble hearing me. Should I lean in a little bit? Um, can you I think me? you're okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I think you're okay. Okay, um, so let's pull into focus the, the incredible violence of individual white men in Barbados buying 12-year-old girls, one by one by one by one. Um, and let's also, though, remember what they are learning, what those girls are learning as they're being pulled away, and what the remaining women and men are learning as they're watching these girls being pulled away. All of this is profoundly um, present, mm. and yet it's, it's in records that are designed for us not to see those girls. Um, and that's, so it's these eruptions, right? These archival eruptions where like, oh, I can, I see this now, right? Um, and I didn't see it before, uh, but it just requires, it requires us asking different questions. Um, that's all, you know, that's all. I'm sorry, my phone just rang. So I'm just turning the volume down like a person <laughs> would on a friggin' Zoom call. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it um, and it's a kind of thing where, where once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes. You know, like you can't not then go back and pretend that this this phrase didn't mean what you what what now you know it does. Yeah. Um, and and for some of us reading, 
it's also, you know, reading, reading how you're reading these records is also this deep affirmation that that phrase always meant what we thought it meant. <laughs> and that we can actually see this for what it is that, you know, mm -hmm. by her means, her increase, you know, yeah. her enjoyment, uh, yeah. not her enjoyment, his enjoyment, mm -hmm. that these are phrases that are used deliberately, and they're not casual, and they're not without layers and levels of of violence that is meant to do work that you a don't see it and b that that violence is enacted on these women right. and, and girls and at I, this point. And I think, and I want to be really clear. Like I, I feel very strongly that there is a place for like deep archival engagement, right? Like I want us, I want us to still be going into those archives because I think that understanding the technology of erasure, right, mm -hmm. is is part of our task here is to say, okay, so you actually need to sit and read all of these documents, these wills, these bills of sale, and 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 understand the edifice of erasure that is going on. It sometimes by you know one of the things that first drew me to this project is that you know there were reports from colonial governors with you know giving demographic data saying. For example, that in early uh, English New York, um, after the English take the colony from the Dutch, that there are more women than men in the city of Manhattan, right? In this, in the city of New York, uh, we know that from demographic reports, right? And then there are uprisings in which no women are named, and no, no, that that under the rubric of the word Negro or or or, or rebels, right? There, there's a full erasure of women and. One conclusion would be, well, women don't, you know, uh, participate in rebellion, and I don't think that that is true. Um, and I think that part of what we have to be attentive to is the again, this is a this is a moment of gendering that's about um, enabling English colonial officials and others reporters to 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 ignore the presence of literally hundreds and hundreds of people because it slots into a kind of rationalizing discourse, right? So that it makes it, it, it creates sense where there is no sense. Um, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a technology that we as historians, as readers, as thinkers, as people who are concerned with the afterlife of slavery, right? As people who are, who are taking up Sadia Hartman's call to think about what is it about what we are living with now, who are trying to do, as Christina Sharp asks us to do, the wake work, to think about what has what is has followed in its wake, the wake of this of the slave ship. Um, we're being asked to, uh, to think carefully about the technologies that get us here, you know. And I think that's so I want I'm I want us to be in the archives, even as I want us to know how infuriating <laughs> the archives are. <laughs> um, I mean, this leads us to, you know, another place where the archives are both really loud and strangely silent, both in the moment and also um, by historians, which is um, the archives of, of revolt and modernage. Um, and you go really deeply into um, some really, you know, tried and true myths that we have held <laughs> in historiography, um, which is that women um, or girls um, revolted um, in different ways. They're resisting, you know, resistance is a spectrum. There's revolt and there's revolution. There's um, truancy versus, you know, Kram Marunaj, like all these kinds of, you know, um, organizations of people's behavior, enslaved people's behavior against the slaveholding regime and organizations that have been, that we have gendered, that we have separated enslaved women and enslaved men, enslaved girls and boys from each other. And, and that has seemed to um, sort of coincide with the, with the literature, but you turn that whole archive inside out um, and tell us to think about this differently. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's because I, so I do, you know, the, the, the nerdy historian part of me is the part that wants to read the earliest possible thing that I can get to, right? And then to move my way forward. And so for me, if, if, I've, if I've understood something about 
um, the experience that that women had on the Middle Passage, the um, the the saturation of um, of the slave trade uh, by people who who recognize themselves as kin to one another, the ways in which the language of race and slavery and gender and family are kind of uh, like starting to get entangled so much earlier than the like 18th century, this is when racism, you know, exists fully. Like, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> no, that doesn't, you know, if you, if you start reading from that point and you move your way forward, then when, when the, the governor of Jamaica calls, said that Maroons are stealing women, right? When women are bounty or, or um, oh, I just lost the word, but the other word, like you go and it, suddenly that just doesn't, it's like, wait a minute. We know also that those communities are increasing naturally. So why, so why would we take the word of the colonial governor who, we've always, who we already understand is steeped in the rationalizing practice of making this regime make sense? Why would we take his word that those women are slaves to the Maroons? Why wouldn't we see those women as Maroons? You know, like as people who are trying to craft a new way of living and of protecting their freedom. You know, like it's it just doesn't make sense to not ask that question. And hopefully, I mean, I you know, you can read my reading of those documents and say, okay, Jennifer, I don't I don't know that I agree with you. You know, I don't know that, but but at least we have to ask that question. We have to we have to we have to presume that you know, we have to presume that women are thinking about what's happening to them. I, that doesn't seem so radical. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's giving me, you know, like how people talk about black resistance even today, like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of iconic moments, you know, Rosa sat down or, yeah. um, you know, Ferguson just happened, Minnesota, Minnesota just happened, yeah. you know, like it, it just, it was, it, I could never have believed it. It just came out of nowhere. It was just, they were so mad and they were so upset. Right, it's an explosion. Like, who could have foreseen it happening before? So, I, I'm not plugging the book at all, but I just want to. I just, I, I, if you, if you haven't seen the cover, right? I, I want us to look at this woman's face. <laughs> I want us to see, and this is what I talk about in the preface. I want us to see the knowing that is in her eyes, and to understand that that is not about the skill of the painter, although he's clearly a skillful painter, but it's about her refusal to look at him except through that knowing gaze, right? And that's what I, and, and, and that painting is painted in 1585 in Bologna. It's, it's really early, right? But it's really early for an American historian, 1585. It's not early for a historian of, the, of, of slavery in the Mediterranean at all, right? It's a hundred years uh, after slavery is happening, racial slavery is happening in the Mediterranean or more. Don't yell at me, at you, my medievalists out there. Um, but you know what I mean? And so like the idea that people are, are not aware of what, what, you know, they don't know where it's going to end up necessarily, but they understand something about what's happening to them. That seems to me a fundamental place to start when you're writing any history. Um, but it feels really, it feels really um, crucial to do so when you're writing the history of Black women because this, I mean, we are living in a moment right now in which, uh, we are living in a moment right now in which the ways in which violence against Black people is is both perpetrated and erased, erased from memory is, it's not shocking, um, but it is overwhelming, right? It is, uh, and, and I think, I believe as the historian should, that if I can understand, if I can, if we can talk about how something comes into being, we can then strategize about, about how to pull back. Yeah, yeah. and it's happening right now. Yeah. This is happening right, right. now. Well, actually, actual laws getting passed to not teach exactly exactly. this, much less the logic of how exactly. this knowledge is justified exactly. and legitimized exactly. and created. We are living in incredibly dangerous times. 
Karen. I see Karen. I know. <laughs> yep. As we as we um, go dark. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, so so there's some super interesting questions that have come in to me directly. I want to thank folks for doing that. Um, I'm going to offer uh, one, which I think may follow on here from precisely the point you were making um, about violence and erasure, which is a question about methodology in the archives, um, Dr. Morgan. And it is about how one deals with the size of the information. That is the way that the information is recorded in the archive and how you access it. And whether it is that as the question, this is from Sharon Leon, um, it, is it the, the grain size of the fact helps produce erasure? And how does one, does if both the tininess of the fact in the archive produces erasure and sometimes the aggregations flatten out and produce erasure, can you speak to um, how to work that um, complexity? Yeah, I mean, I think that every every um, every time I can say of a person's name, every, anytime I can tell you the name of a woman in the in in who's who's enslaved in this time period, um, it feels like a tiny little victory, right? That I can that that I can rescue um, some aspect of of the echo of her life. Uh, and and narrate it right, but it is. But the word grain is precisely it. There's a, there's, and I think this is. A, I mean, I I know this is a this is a larger question about methodology because I I even though I had much more I had much more access to to digital records uh, when I wrote this book than when I wrote the first book, right? Um, I was still mostly sitting in archives and reading slowly you know it was I was and I had I had the time I mean it took a long time um, but you know I had a tenure track and tenure job I I had um, I had the support uh, to take some time and go to archives and sit there for a few weeks and read carefully um, and go, read past the boredom um, through to like with the with the conviction that something was going to come to me um, that I would find that grain. Um, and I think that with the, there's an enormous possibility that's been opened up by all of the digital humanities projects that are making um, uh, evidence more available to us. Um, but I also worry that that there that maybe there's something um, about that time that it takes to find things that is also a thinking time. Right, it's also a time to to try to grapple with and to account for and to reckon with um, the numbers that you're seeing, the literally the numbers of pages uh, that you have to go through before you find the story of the woman who um, drops her lit tobacco pipe into the hold of a slave ship, um, exploding the gunpowder, uh, and and to put a very quick end to that journey. Um, it's two lines in a lot of pages. So I don't know, like there's, I, I, I think that we need to be thinking, having a conversation about both what is possible and then maybe what is lost through um, our, our, our ability to search uh, and find records, like that you can literally search the word slave or Negro and find things quickly. And maybe that's going to let us Maybe that's going to have the effect of, of of build, you know. So it's not a grain anymore. It's it's actually a good. It's it's a pile. But I think that part of what I'm after again is like this technology of erasure, and I need to see how um, hard it is to find those women, even though I know that they're there. There are lots of questions, but I wonder, um, Dr. Johnson, if you wanted to um, address exactly that issue around digitization and mm -hmm. archival practice and research. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, not specifically, but one of my questions was for Jennifer about, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it this way, is that when I was reading, and I, and I, I tweeted this at one point, um, I said, this this is a text that should be assigned in, in all DH classes. Like, it mm -hmm. should be part of DH 101. It should be digital humanities canon for the ways it really reshapes how we think about 
data, how we use data, and for the explicit debates that you're taking up. You have Minson Price, you have Curtin, you have the Voyages database, you take up Fogel and Angerman on breeding, which is hilarious because I read that and I just tweeted about breeding <laughs> and how that should you know, return to our conversations about sexual violence and slavery because that's how women are talking about it in um, in, in the US context, at least in the 19th century. Um, so I was wondering, you know, um, what, I don't know what you thought of, were you thinking about that when you were, you know, crafting this refusal of these ways of thinking or is there something incidental that, you know, that, that came up, you know, I, you know, yes, just say more, whatever you I, want. I think, you know, it, it, I'm, I think that I was writing sort of through and against this presumption that you need to find a certain quantity of evidence to make an argument. And obviously we, you know, again, like I, we do need to find a certain quantity of evidence to make arguments, but sometimes what we have to do is find the way that the evidence has been shaped, has been like preformed for us and therefore is is producing a kind of um, uh, what is it? It's like a it's like when you're you're overly leaning on a claim, right? You you you're like, well, there are 72 of these people here, and it's like, well, are there 72 people here, or has the archive told you that there are 72 people here? And like, how you know? And and yet, yeah, sometimes we can know that, but then uh, sometimes it doesn't. It what helps is understanding the process by which the claims are being made. Um, and I think that that's about one of the things that I say in my acknowledgments that I just want to say is that, you know, there are a lot of us who are writing histories of gender, sexuality, and slavery right now. There are a lot of us who are writing histories of race in the early modern period. I, this is not an isolate, this is not like a little blip in, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in history departments anymore. And, mm -hmm. and that has, a, that is the other thing, right? That is the thing that gives you the, the authority and the permission to say like, you know, I can know, I can make this claim. I can, I can, um, I can show you where this claim comes from. And I can tell you, I think, I think there was an earlier version of myself that would have been like, oh, don't let them know that this is only one line in a 42 page document, right? Like that somehow the fact that it's only one line makes it not evidence. When in fact, sure. the fact that it's only one line makes it a really particular kind of evidence. So, I don't know. We are so close to being out of time. I know there's so many <laughs> questions and there's so many ways that, so again, I'm just plugging again, everybody come again tomorrow so that we can continue talking about this, but I'll, I'll stop talking. So there's room for a little bit more. <laughs> Let me pitch you, let me pitch you one more and then I'm going to sign off and see how you all want to handle the conclusion here, which is one more question, which was about, um, about numeracy. Mm -hmm. And the question was, um, can, um, numeracy as a concept, but also can you talk about how numeracy and the way that it um, uh, iterates through race, other forms of racial violence in the law, incarceration, etc., is significant for you? That is, um, yeah, okay, and I'm going to sign off there. So um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time reading about was um, debates about currency, the value of gold moving in and out of, of um, the English treasury in the 1620s, right? And, and you know, I, I, what I realized is that in those arguments, there was, there was something being formed about like the materiality of value and like the, the consistency of value, the, 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 the desire to find a form of value that didn't, you know, that, that like gold, that was tangible, that you could hold on to, but that it was, you know, it was a fetish object like so many others, right? Um, uh, what, what became clear to me is that thinking through numeracy and these new ideas about rationality was a form of claims making that was about hiving off the kind of messy, loamy, earthy, bloody, shitty space of slavery and the slave trade, right? It was about saying like, no, this is a business. This is a business. I have books, I, you know, I have costs and, and uh, benefits, et cetera. Like this is a, it, so that the, so that assigning numerical value in a double entry book, you know, in a ledger 
is about a practice of, uh, of creating rationality and control over a, a ship of dying people, you know, like it's a, and we continue to struggle with that. Like we continue, I'm really interested in seeing how we talk about this moment of, of death in, in, in COVID that we're just coming out of and where we, I keep on saying, I'm sure I'm not the only one that like the undercounting of death in parts of this world are, is just, it's going to be astonishing when we finally understand. Um, and, and because there's a kind of rationality about report, I'm sure that all of us were reading like how many COVID deaths this year, how many, or this week, how many COVID deaths here? You look at that map, where are there more COVID deaths, with less COVID deaths? And, and you, and, and, and there's, and those maps are so racialized and the numbers are so racialized. And, and yet if we're not, if we're not careful, we start to think that the numbers exist outside of the, of the violence that they're trying to assess. I don't know. I feel like I just got lost somewhere, but that's what I was trying to think through. And, and I feel like if there's an originary moment, right, in the, in the mess that we're in right now, it's in the, the work of the ship captain to write down in a shorthand the death of one Negro woman and one Negro man and, you know, like to tally those deaths. Um, that's something that, that is, is a profound moment of, of the intersection of numeracy and racial ideology that I think we're still grappling with. I think we're out of time, basically. Um, uh, Jennifer, I, I'm going to steal this opportunity to thank you so much for just all of everything. Um, you have been so, 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 so important in how I think about the world and the work that I do and what I've been able to do um, with research and everything. So I'm going to steal this moment to just shower you with admiration and, and love and appreciation truly for gifting us this book, for gifting us laboring women and for all of the mentoring and the work that you do behind the scenes. It's unbelievable. It really, really is. And I know those in the chat can attest to it. So um, thank you for again, making my brain buzz here with, um, with, with me and with everybody here. Thank you all, thank everybody who's, who's here. And thank you, um, Jessica, for this conversation. And I can't wait to continue it tomorrow. <laughs> the most exciting sign off that I've ever had because we get to do it <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. See everyone tomorrow at See five o'clock. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you both. Absolutely spectacular. <laughs> Good night. Good night.